Take your seats, please. We're about to get started um, on what is usually our most popular panel, actually, Meet the Funders. Um, everybody, please sit down. Quiet down and sit down, Ken. Um, and I'm just going to uh, let Andrea take it away, but first introduce Andrea. Um, Andrea Medich is our um, moderator, and she founded Back Alley Entertainment, quiet please, 10 years ago. Um, to provide production, creative advising, and strategic services to films, festivals, and university. Uh, her most recent film was Dangerous Acts. It won an Emmy in 2015. And um, Buck won the 2011 Sundance Audience Award and was shortlisted for an Oscar. Um, she executive produced the Oscar-winning Man on Wire and the nominated Encounters at the End of the World in 2009. She's also executive producer, produced such films as Grizzly Man, in the Shadow of the Moon, The Killer Within, Double Time, and The Flight That Fought Back. And she's currently in post-production on Cage Fighter. I will let Andrea take it away from here and um, enjoy the panel. Great to be here. Um, and I'm really, before I introduce, we, are, we look like a panel, but this is not supposed to be a panel. This is supposed to be a workshop. So um, we're hoping that you will engage with us and be part of this conversation rather than us droning at you. Not that they're going to drone. I'm, I'm going to drone. Um, so uh, we want to know sort of who you are. Um, how many people here, and these are the categories are all slipping, which is part of the reason we want to know that. Uh, how many here would consider themselves independent documentary long-form producers? OK, a fair number. So how many would consider themselves investigative journalists? Um, and and need, need, dare I ask, print? Some print. Um, how many sort of hybrid, uh, short form? So we've got pretty much everybody. I don't, I think, need to ask who's looking for funding because we know the answer to that. Um, because the funding situation is terrible in all of these various fields and hybrids. So. Um, here to help us with that and engage with you all is um, is a, a very interesting and eclectic group of folks. And I think what I'm going to do is um, I'm going to introduce them by name and title, but then I'm going to ask each one of you to tell sort of your origin, the origin story of your organization and, and your role in it. Uh, you know, sort of where where it came from, where you're going, and and then we'll we'll go from there. So. This is uh, Richard Logan, who is on the end. He's the president of the Riva and David Logan Fund, based in Chicago. And then we have Maxine Franklin, who is a founding director of BritDoc, which is started in London, but is based in the U is based in now in New York. And then Tamara Gold, who is at ITVS and is based here in um, D.C. So. I'm going to start with you. Why don't you tell us? You're, you've got the harder task because ITVS has a, a slightly more tangled right. origin story than Brit Dock and, and the Logan Fund. But. Great. Well, Andrea, thank you so much, and thank you so much. Uh, my personal origin story is that I um, really am one of you. I came as a filmmaker, um, and you know, really just from a deep belief that media is the way to change the world. Um, after graduating from college, I had a Fulbright and went to Latin America to study cinema and social change. And when I came back to the US, I was looking for organizations that I thought really had the ability to, um, to move the needle on many of our social issues. Um, I ended up at an organization in San Francisco called the Bay Area Video Coalition, BayVac, which I hope some of you know, um, and um, ended up becoming the executive director of BayVac. And, um, really felt that I was missing making films on my own and went to ITVS in San Francisco for some preliminary funding um, to make a film in Afghanistan and received that funding and got to know the folks at ITVS, went and made my film, distributed my film through PBS, um, and then ended up joining the staff at ITVS um, over 11 years ago to grow both our international um, area where we were funding films from around the world, um, and then more recently in the last five years, serving as the senior vice president for national productions and strategic partnerships, and bringing major projects through um, the, the public television system, and really trying to innovate 
always new ways to serve independent producers. And with that, let me turn to the origin story of ITVS and why I personally feel so proud to be able to be a part of an organization that really exists to serve all of you, uh, which is that as public broadcasting, um, which is something we just cannot take for granted in this day and age, was being um, founded in this country, um, independent producers in the late 60s really advocated to make sure that not only would the airwaves be public, but that there would be content that was meaningful created by independent producers that could go on those airwaves. And that was really the beginning of ITVS, to ensure that meaningful, independent content could be produced um, and distributed through public broadcasting. And so thanks to the advocacy of producers like you, um, ITVS was was born, um, and 25 years later, we just had our 25th birthday uh, this year, we're in our 25th year, we have funded over 1,500 documentaries. Um, we take our, um, we take our, I would say, our demographics really seriously and that we are deeply, deeply committed to representing uh, voices that we're not seeing enough of in mainstream media, both the voices of women um, and producers of color. Um, in the last year, um, I'm so proud to say that you know we have supported 50% um, films by women filmmakers and 68% by filmmakers of color. And those numbers you'll see throughout our history as a commitment that we make throughout um, our organization and have before Hollywood took notice of this issue. But it's one that I think we all need to be really committed to. So that's the ITVS origin story. That's my personal origin story and how those two things come together. And I look forward to sort of unwinding um, and talking with you about how you can connect and be engaged with ITVS and get the support that your uh, fellow producers um, advocated for to make sure it was available to all of you. It's a good origin story. <laughs> um, okay, hi, um, mine is kind of like slightly, a slightly different trajectory. Um, so I launched BritDoc um, some 11 years ago with two colleagues, um, Jess Search and BD Finzi, who we, myself and Jess, came from a broadcast background in the UK, at a place called Channel 4, which I was deeply passionate about many moons ago. Um, and we had been working in, uh, we had, had a unit called Independent Film and Video, which seems really archaic now. Um, <laughs> And we could see the channel taking a very different direction to the direction that we believed um, media should be taking. Um, and Channel 4, which used to be, um, you know, a real bastion of speaking truth to power and, um, you know, being on, on the edge, became, was becoming very quickly um, a little bit repugnant. And <laughs> doing a lot of reality TV, which I just didn't really see at my place in that. Um, so we... Um, beleaguered lots of cultural institutions in the UK at the time and um, got them all to sort of support us in advocating to the channel that they should let us go off as our little independent film and video unit and um, they should support us in launching a um, foundation to support independent filmmakers because actually the stories that we wanted to tell were stories that did still speak truth to power and that weren't just appealing to low lowest common denominator. So we, um, we set off and launched that, which originally started because Channel 4 gave us a million a year for the first three years. It was very much about British filmmakers. Um, we very quickly decided that you can only do a limited amount with that amount of money. You can only support a certain amount of films. And we wanted to actually be much more broad in terms of how we worked with the entire you know, community of filmmakers and, and sort of field building for independent media. Um, so we then launched The Good Pitch and... Five years ago, we launched a, um, a, a fund specifically for long-form journalism in documentary with the Bertha Foundation. And again, that was about sort of, you know, looking out and sort of saying, where, you know, where do we see that things, you know, we're not serving the community quite right just yet. Um, and with Bertha, who also, you know, are very suitable partners for this sort of work because they're very happy to get behind high-risk projects. Um, so they've been a great partner, and we've, um, yeah, we've sort of hopefully been trying to push a lot of that forward. Um, so that's, I guess, the birth story of BritDoc and, and of sort of the journalism fund. And then I'd say sort of like more recently, we're also, in the last few years, we've 
seen quite a few of us filmmakers being sued. So <laughs> we are more recently trying to work much more closely with filmmakers in terms of how we support them every step of the way. And that's not just around production funding, which is also you know, the, the sexy part of the funding, um, but also around sort of making sure that they're secure in the field and making sure that when they get back, you know, they're working with a lawyer, they're working with bona fide journalists so that everything is truthful and fact-checked so that they're not going to be sued. And when they are sued, because that's how corporations try and bury stories, that we stand by them and we support them in through, you know, throughout that process as well. So there's sort of like a whole... Um, currently, we're ha having a whole sort of reconsideration about how we work with filmmakers and how we can support filmmakers and subjects and, you know, in fact, you know... Um, drivers or whoever else it is on the ground. You know, if you need to get somebody out of country because actually the film comes out and suddenly you know, they're at risk, how do we support filmmakers and the wider filmmaking team at every step? So you're actually looking into what happens when you've got a filmmaker or, or subjects on the ground who are at risk when the, after the film comes out, that you're, you're continuing yeah. your work after after this, after you put money yeah. into the actual making of the film? In the last sort of two years, we had to have somebody, quite a lot of it's been around the DRC, actually. Um, we, we did a film called Virunga that was based in the DRC, um, and we had to pull a gentleman and his family out of the country and relocate them for a year. And sort of, you know, and it's just about being sensitive to, it's not just the director that's going in that who's putting themselves at risk, but actually the people on the ground are also putting themselves at a lot of risk, and we oftentimes don't necessarily see that, and we need to. I don't think my story is as, is this on? Yeah, uh, my story is not as polished as either one of these. <laughs> and um, my name is Richard Logan. I uh, am the president of the Reva and David Logan Foundation. It's not just a coincidence that we have the same name. Uh, I'm one of the sons of the founder, and that's how I got into the foundation. Uh, I, lived, I lived in the UK for about 40 years, over 40 years. Uh, and I do have a background uh, in software and in media. And it has always been my belief that journalism, investigative journalism, is the bulwark, I'm going to use the same line, uh, of democracy and freedom. And that goes way back, and I worked in the print industry for many years. At any rate, uh, we're a family foundation, and the rules in a family foundation are somewhat different uh, than other organizations. Uh, we do... Uh, work in a lot of different areas, uh, social justice, the arts, uh, scholarship, as well as investigative journalism. I've got my notes in all kinds of different directions here, so as I turn the paper, you'll get a little sense of how we work. Uh, we are major funders of groups like CIR uh, and Reveal, and the uh, investigative reporting program uh, at Berkeley. Uh, we are funders of groups, investigative journalism groups around the world, the UK, uh, and elsewhere. Uh, and we have a growing interest uh, in smaller investigative journalism areas in the United States in particular. And that's something we're going to be pushing for the next couple of years. In terms of uh, film uh, and this direct area, uh, we are direct funders of various documentaries and films. Uh, we are funder here for this festival and others. Uh, we fund nuts and bolts as well uh, for several groups. We have helped them archive their stuff so that if, <clears throat> if their offices burn down, uh, their 20 years of hard work doesn't disappear. Uh, I think the thing that, you know, distinguishes a family foundation, uh, and you, you must understand, we are approachable. We're happy to uh, hear from you no matter who you are and no matter what you're doing. Uh, we are also promiscuous. Uh, we'll, we'll consider almost anything, all right? <laughs> uh, and I guess later on... Good. Uh, yeah, I don't want to get too deeply into that because, you know, we'll get sued. Uh, but 
you know, as long as it's well considered and it's it's real, uh, you know, we'll we'll give it some thought time. Uh, you know, I, I think that's a good description of what we do. Uh, we are an eccentric bunch, uh, as well, and that you'll find out. Uh, and and I've got to tell you up front, if any of you are from California, if the Giants beat the Cubs. There will be no funding in California for many years. It'll be like the drought, all right? Uh, so we've talked a lot. Now, Richard, you touched on the fact that there's a range you do in some individual films, but also uh, doing a lot of granting and, and foundation work through organizations that may be working with investigative journalists. So one of the things that I sort of would like each one of you to touch on, we've mostly talked about films. And, and, and so part of what I, we were talking about beforehand and that I've been thinking about today is sort of what's the relationship among the different kinds of media? Do you fund any other kinds of media other than filmmaking? Is it short form, long form? Uh, is, are you doing any kind of follow-up marketing? I mean, Maxine, you also mentioned post-field work, but, you know, are you doing direct funding of any kinds mm -hmm. of other media? And, well, let's start there. How about you guys? Great. Um, so, um, the short answer is yes, we are. Um, and the longer answer is why we are. Most of you in the room probably know ITVS as a funder of long-form documentaries. Uh, which we are continue, you know, we continue to be very, very committed to, especially as we see other sources of funding, um, you know, just becoming harder and harder uh, to secure in certain regards. Um, but at the same time, we see opportunities uh, both around short form content. Um, we have a new channel, I'll call it, that will um, you'll be hearing more about that we're launching um, called Storycast, which um, will be a platform for uh, short form digital series, um, and some of you may already be familiar, we have something called Digital Open Call, which is sort of the digital sister or digital brother or digital sibling to our open call for projects that really make more sense as a digital, um, as digital uh, formats, and we'll consider series as well, an episodic series um, in digital formats through our digital open call. Um, the other piece of what we're funding is um, really around journalism, and it goes back to conversations, I mean, for me, personally, it it's like an aha moment that I had when I was making that film in Afghanistan, and I would, I'd been there for eight months, and I was at the Loya Jirga, where they were ratifying the new constitution. There was a press corps who had come in to you know, film the moment, the sort of founding father moment where this constitution was gonna be ratified, and I was filming Emily, um, Emily, NPR reporter, doing her satellite you know, video, and she's literally doing her report, and she, she stops as I'm filming her, and she goes, what, Saddam Hussein was found? This happens that day. Literally, the whole press corps just is gone that day. No one's there to watch the big constitution being signed. And I realized that there is this very deep and complex relationship between long form documentary filmmakers and the press. And yet there are so many opportunities and, and synergies. Um, so 10 years later, in extended conversation with the MacArthur Foundation and others who really care about this space, really thinking about how to maximize and take better advantage of the work that long form filmmakers are doing and connect it more actively um, with journalism. It's not the same thing. You know, the, the social point of view filmmaking that many of our filmmakers are doing is not, you know, it's not necessarily, um, you know, reporting. And I don't want to call it the same thing as investigative journalism. But there are, there's sort of a crossover in the Venn diagram and there's ways to really deepen and add context um, and really help help our information just get better and better and connect story and the relationships that you all have with your subjects in the field to the breaking news 24 seven news cycle. And so through, um, through a, um, a new initiative, we have been looking for ways to connect long form film and filmmakers with opportunities to connect with reporting and reporters. Go the other direction at all? Uh, in other words, would, would somebody who's coming from an investigative journalism background who approaches you, is that something you consider if they are, what are, the, what are your requirements for that? Do you, does it need a storytelling? It needs a story, for us, it needs a filmmaker attached. We certainly, I mean, most, I would say most of the projects that we've done so far have been um, derivative of longer form work, either, you know, a short film that's made 
you know, from footage that has already been filmed for a longer film that may become more relevant based on the news. And we've distributed those pieces through a number of news outlets like the New York Times, The Atlantic, Mother Jones, um, really experimenting with reaching new audiences with those stories. Um, but an example of what you're describing is actually where there's, you know, we, there was a film by a filmmaker named Dan Berman called Centoya's Story. I might have a clip if we have time. I'm happy to show it. I don't know. Anyway, but he had made this documentary several years back um, about a girl who, as a young, I mean, an, a young teen, shot a man, um, admitted to the crime, and was sentenced, you know, for life, basically, not according to juvenile justice. Um, when the Supreme Court decision around juvenile justice came up, um, her, he and a journalist were partnered together to go ahead and find out what happened to her and look into her story in a seven-part series with original journalism combined with new footage um, that he put together. And it's a seven-part series that's being distributed through the Tennessean. Um, if we have time, do you want to just take a look at one of the clips? Is that all right? Are we able to see? All right, let's take a look. I would like you to have some kind of an adult life. That's all I'm saying. Well, I have to think about that every day. What? Me taking life. Right. Facing life is ignoring these people, honey, so you can have a life. At the rate you're going, you won't have a life. I thought he was reaching for a gun, so I'm like, oh, shit. you know what I'm saying, that's what he's doing. It's gonna mark me or break me or something. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. 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 Yeah, that's what I'm
You're not listening. I meant him money. He wasn't gonna let me go nowhere. He told me he'd kill me. He knows where my mom lives. And I know the dude chose me, so I almost passed out. He's not afraid to kill me. When I lived, I was looking for a ride so I can go out to East Nashville. Who were you going to see in East Nashville? Well, I wasn't going to see particularly anyone. I was going to an area that I knew was very, I don't know, it's, a lot of people go there and prostitute. Okay. When you walked up to the Sonic, who approached you? A man in a white truck. And is this the person that has been referred to throughout this hearing, Mr. Allen? Yes. He didn't want to go to the hotel. He said that he wanted to go to his house because there was no one there. At that time, he was just finished telling me about his accomplishments and saying how that he used to be in the Army and that he was a sharpshooter in the Army. And then he had told me how a lot of women want him for his money and that he wanted someone to make love with him with desire. Okay. So we're going we're gonna to wind it. Yeah, we're going to wind it. It goes on for a few more minutes. But this is the first of seven parts that you can see it it, it's been playing on the Tennessean in partnership with original journalism that is looking at the juvenile sentencing laws and the Supreme Court decision. So they worked, the filmmaker worked with the reporter in a partnership. Again, it's not illustrating the article and the article's not illustrating the film, but they work together in a really complementary way to put a human story um, ahead of, you know, all of the cases that when you read about the numbers, this, you know, you have the ability to really um, delve in and he has years and years of footage of Centoya and so the ability to generate um, you know a connection between people who are reading the news and people who are watching the film the other really interesting side effect that we're seeing is that we put links to the whole film um, next to the short pieces and it's generating a really extended life for people who go and watch the whole film when they see shorter pieces so as filmmakers something to be aware of um, that it really is helping build larger audiences and people who don't necessarily turn on the television um, to find those to find the films, but maybe are looking at the New York Times or maybe looking at a different uh, journalism outlet and then find a documentary. So why don't you walk us through how you actually what parts of this did you fund? So and how how did they approach you and how did this unfold? Sure, so as an example of of what these guys might want to sure. do when they approach. So as I said, the filmmaker Dan Berman had made Centoya's story, which had aired on Independent Lens um, several years back. Um, we had been in contact with him about another project, and when the Supreme Court decision around juvenile justice came up, um, we talked to him about doing an update about Centoya's story and what had happened to her since she had been incarcerated, because it's obviously a story you get really involved and want to know what has happened to her. Um, as our team was looking at the opportunities around journalism, we thought this would be a great story to connect with a journalism partner. And Dan, the filmmaker, thought of the Tennessean because he knew a journalist there, and they brought us the project. We funded the seven-part series, um, in addition to having invested dollars into the original documentary. Um, we'll talk a little bit sure. later about how you the actually process. go through sure. the process. Great. But I, Max, I wanted to ask you, in some ways, Brit Doc started with a notion of what we may be evolving that we have called social change or social activism. How do you see the crossover between that and investigative journalism and, and how you get involved in the kinds of things that you may or may not be looking for? Um, in some ways, th there is definitely an intersection there, but I think in some ways as well, there's um, they don't necessarily feed into each other completely. So. Um, the journal, you know, most of the social issue stuff that we do comes primarily through running an event called The Good Pitch, which is around bringing films together with um, both film funders, but also agents of social change, whether that be from foundations, from government organizations, various different people that can sort of, that are already working around the issue that the film is bringing to the fore. Are you with Good Pitch? Some of you are. Um, do you want to briefly describe, I mean, it's now worldwide, and you, yeah. okay, so you're bringing filmmakers and funders. We basically, we bring filmmakers that are making films on a social issue that have, that, you know, that the films are normally pretty well developed. They're probably in post-production by this stage. Um, and then we're bringing them together with traditional funding partners, but also field building partners who are working on the issue area so that they can actually sort of activate the film to create change, whether that be top down through the government or through 
changing of laws or, you know, basically bring a community together who can activate around your film. So we tend to look at it, it's kind of like a pitching forum, but we try to be a bit more positive. Um, and we try to look at it as sort of the ideal dinner party. If you like, if you are making a film, say, um, <sighs> oh God, let me try and think of one. Um, say Virunga, which is around trying to get a, um, an, a multinational um, oil company out of illegal drilling in um, the Congo in a national park. So say you wanted to have the ideal dinner party for that, you'd probably have somebody from UNESCO because it's a UNESCO World Heritage Site. Ideally, you'd have somebody from an investment company because that's actually who's going to lobby the oil company. Um, so, you, you know, it's basically about bringing all of these networks of people together so that can create change with your film. Now, that's a slightly separate drive to what we do with the Journalism Fund, although there is, a, you know, there is crossover. Um, but we don't, I don't generally look, when, when we're funding films, I, I'm not necessarily thinking, what's your agenda here? You know, where, where's your, what are you trying to change? That's not the first, it's not my first sort of point. Um, my first point is, you know, what's, what's the story, what's the film? Um, and I think, you know, with everything that we do, it's got to be about, you've got to be making a great film. You can't create change unless you've got a great film, in my, in my opinion. Um, so now I'm getting really muddled. <laughs> <laughs> so I guess I think those are, those are slightly twin tracks, but I think they cross over. Um, and I think so the journalism still takes the fore on, on that production fund. Um, and so, but with that, we definitely, again, we're similar to yourselves, we're definitely more, um, we're, we're very much director driven. Um, it's around sort of like enabling documentary filmmakers. Um, we've recently actually partnered with CIR on two of our projects. Um, which has actually been an amazing partnership. One of, one of the films is being done by an investigative journalist, Mads Brugger, who's from um, Denmark, who's amazing. Um, but he's partnered with them in terms of sort of like, you know, unpicking new information, having both journalists and lawyers on the ground in the US. Um, and we've also partnered them um, with another film that we're working on, whereby on both of these, we're going to start doing podcasts as well with Reveal. So that's actually, it's quite an interesting sort of new trajectory in terms of, I think there is definitely an appetite as well for um, process. People are interested in the investigative journalist process. And I think a lot of these, you know, the podcasts, we can, we can go off into different avenues and in really exciting ways that you can't necessarily always explore in a 90-minute movie. And I'll stop. So, but are, well, um, not yet. Are you funding podcasts? Are you funding podcasts? Not, we're not funding them directly. We're probably going to be working together to seek funding for them with CIR. So what you're really seeing is that these can be spin-offs from the core. Yeah. So both of you are still looking for the core film. Yeah. Uh, for, is that true for you as well, Richard? Not necessarily the core film. I think we come from the investigative journalism side. And, you know, it, it manifests itself with uh, radio, with film, with podcasts, uh, with long-form journalism of, of all kinds, uh, and advocacy even. Uh, Jamie Calvin, who will be here tomorrow, I guess, uh, was funded by us. Uh, and his work uh, is, is a mix of long form and advocacy uh, on a long term basis, uh, you know, that came to fruition, of course, recently with Laquan McDonald and that story, uh, as well as uh, other Chicago police stories. Uh, but we also have invested in things like the Logan Symposium, which is, there's one in Berkeley which is uh, run by Lowell Bergman and the investigative reporting program there, which is, uh, you know, uh, a, a, a more conservative, uh, uh, you know, re journalism uh, forum. But in the UK, of course, we, and in Germany, we have been running the Logan Symposium, which has more to do with Cybersecurity, surveillance, and uh, it's, it's, we hope, has had great impact and moved the discussion along. Uh, impact is, is really a big issue uh, for us because we have limited funds and we like to squeeze as much pain out of every dollar as we can. 
So, so when you're looking for impact, how, what are your measures, when you're looking at a project, what are your measures for success? What, what, do you, what kind of impact are you, you talking about and how do you look for it? I measure metrics. It's always a difficult thing. Uh, you know, I, I, I tend to go on the basis that you know it when you see it. Uh, and it's often after the fact. I mean, we, we've been very lucky, but we're also very thoughtful people, and, and, and we look hard. We do our research. We do our groundwork uh, to, to really know uh, whether there's a good chance that a project is, is going to have impact. And it usually works out. Would you, would you say that's a fundamental criterion then for your selection is, is, is impact? Is, is that? Is, is, is impact, yes, indeed. Uh, you know, it's value for the money we have. I mean, that's the, that's the only sort of measure uh, that we can do. And is that impact, is it a social change impact? Is it a, is a social justice impact? What, what is, what is well, it? Well, it's social it's, change, okay. whether it's in the social justice mm -hmm. field, mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. you know, whether it's in the arts, whether mm -hmm. it's in investigative okay. journalism. You know, you're doing this for a reason, to make a better world. And, you know, we happen to be based in Chicago, and any of you who happen to be from or know of Chicago, things are tough. It's a shithole. Right. Do you, you are looking for impact as well. And, and how do you all measure success? What are, what are your measures for success? Gosh. Um, uh, I think, it, you know, I think it varies. I mean, I think each, each project, you know, I, I genuinely believe that most documentaries have at their heart some form of sort of social justice purpose. And I know that, you know, there, there was, I'm pleased that we've actually moved on from it, but there was some debate around, you know, documentaries and social change, blah, blah. And I genuinely think most of the filmmakers that I work with that are doing, you know, they're, they're working on these films for four or five years, they're doing it for a reason. You know, they want to see something shifting. Um, and so, like, you know, for us, it's about empowering them and enabling them to be able to, A, tell that story, and B, help them shift the dial in the direction that they're trying to move it towards. Um, and again, so, you know, the good pitch is about bringing the partners together so that can do that. And then I suppose, you know, how you measure success, I think, changes for each project, really. I mean, there are some where I would say, you know, again, just on... on on, on the case of Virunga, the success was that we got SoCo to pull out of the Congo. Um, whether or not another oil company is not going to go in, I couldn't tell you. Um, I think in, in the case of Citizen Four, it was a success. You know, actually, just you know, although as much as you know, um, Snowden's revelations were discussed in the media pre the film, and they, of course they were, but I still think that the film elevated people's understanding of Snowden and why he took the steps he did. Um, so again, that was just about sort of shifting the discussion. Um, and, so, and then interestingly, funnily enough, we've just got another film that's just come out called um, An Insignificant Man that's about um, an, like Indian politics um, directed by an, you know, an, an Indian filmmaker. And that is success as well, that, that this film by you know, local filmmakers is now creating sort of waves on the global stage. And that to us is success as well. So I think success genuinely does look like different things. It's not necessarily just about um, bums on seats. It's, it, it, it's, it goes beyond that. And it's about how you sort of feel about the project as well. And sort of like, you know, what's the conversation around it? How about, how about ITVS? And, and so how do you measure success? What, what are you looking for in, in terms of outcomes? You know, where we, I would say where we live, like where we really start and, and finish is really around the film. Um, and the film, you know, can the film, does the film have the right blend of sort of magical thinking and practical reality, right? Does it have the inspiration, but also the ability to be done uh, with the description and the, and the information that we have about the film? And I think more and more, I would say, as the environment shifts, you know, we don't fund engagement campaigns and we don't fund distribution campaigns. What we fund is production. We fund development and production to get your film funded um, and distributed. So we look for, you know, we'd love to know what you're planning to do with the film. We want to know, you know, all the great things that it's about. But really, we want to see if you can get your film made. Um, and that's about do you have some of the issues that you talked about, you know, do you have a safe production plan? What is it going to take for you to safely produce your film? Um, do you have the right team? Do you have the right access? Do you have the right story? Do you have the right characters? 
Um, you know, we we have a hundred percent production completion for any every film that we have funded has been completed and distributed, which for funders who are in the room or not in the room, it's a big it's a big deal. A lot of films don't make it, and I think you know it's it's testimony in some ways to to the filmmakers and to the process. Um, you know, obviously we don't get to fund as many films as we would like, and so, you know, when we invest, it's, you know, we take it incredibly seriously, and we are really gonna stand shoulder to shoulder with you and make sure that that film gets made. So we're looking for, you know, we're looking, we're starting with the film. And, and just sort of staying with you for a moment with ITVS, you have a very long process to go through for applications, so what does a successful application to you look like? And, and what is the process that the, these folks are gonna go through? Well, we have different ways in. I mean, you know, we have a diversity development fund where there are filmmakers of color who can come to us for development money um, and, you know, really before they've shot anything. We also have, you know, just general development funds where filmmakers who have an idea can get something shot so that we can get you into our open call process, um, which is, you know, an open public process just like it sounds, but you have to have footage to show and be considered. It's a public panel um, who reviews it, but to get competitive, you need to have footage shot. So success to us is making sure that some projects like are able to make it all the way through. Um, we also develop something called the Series and Special Projects Fund. So if you're coming, if you already have a public television series partner, if you know you're making a film with Frontline or POV or American Masters or Independent Lens, you can also come and be considered for Series and Special Projects funding, which is less money than if you come through open call, but it comes faster. Um, and so there we're, we're trying to be responsive um, and help filmmakers get their films made. Our process, probably much more so than, than these wonderful colleagues on the stage, it is a, it's a slow process. Um, some filmmakers go through it many times, I will be honest, it's not easy, but it's a high, you know, it's a high pain, high reward <laughs> um, scenario where you will get your film, you'll get notes, you get feedback, your film, your proposals get better. Um, and when you get funding, you know, it's, it's a huge vote that your film will get made. At, at similar parameters, mm -hmm. uh, all right, but I think the, we, we fund a lot of smaller films, uh, and I think there's a great swathe of people who are doing documentaries who will not succeed in your process. Mm -hmm. And even if they have footage, uh, they're caught. They're caught at that editing point, at the, uh, you know, the, the post-production point, or they haven't got the money to market it. You know, they actually have something, but they, they can't get it out to theater and release. That's, that's a tough place to be. Uh, I, I don't know. I mean, how many of, of, of you, does that sound like things that you've done or places you've been? No, no. Yeah, Yeah, but I mean, what do you do? I mean, if you, I, I, I don't know that 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 it's possible for you She'd call, to call to, to get into this process. No, no. But if you can't get to, into that process, or if that process is not going to be successful for you, then you better be. Coming to we us. Need, I mean, you know, there is an ecosystem, right? And and you have to be able to tap into the ecosystem. Different funders fund different parts. Some really, you know, really care about, you know, the impact of engagement, but they're not going to fund production. Others really have an expertise in production funding, and that's where they're going to focus. Others are really emergency funders, and they come through when you have a legal issue or, a, you know, insurance problem. And I think, you know, the job in the seat that you're in is to really understand who are the key players in your ecosystem and make sure that you know who to go to. Um, and that's, that's really a match. I mean, that's, yeah. that's finding the best match for your project. And it's, it Indeed. means knowing who your funder is. I mean, I, I was at Discovery Communications for about 15 years and helped build the first iteration of Discovery Films. And we were actually pitched things on Chinese opera. Well, you know what? Discovery's not gonna do something on Chinese opera. So it is really truly a matter of learning your funder and, and figuring that out. But we're, you're right. There, part of the reason there are people in this room is that there are some huge gaps right now. There's no question. And it's, some of it's being filled by private funding. 
Um, and that can be very complicated for a lot of people. A lot of people think they want to get into the film business and can frankly string a, a journalist or an investigative reporter or a, a, a filmmaker along for a very long time and not put any money into it. So it, it's, a, it's a tough spot. And there's a lot out there right now that is not getting funded. And, and there's just no way around it uh, because the barrier to entry is also very low. So, so you do have to be very, I think, alert to what it is people are looking for and establish relationships with these folks so that they understand sort of who you are and where you're coming from and, and what you're looking for. Yale, I know you had your hand up at some point for this. No, I was looking at the next Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, So, so let's talk about that a little bit among, among all of you. You all fund, actually, interestingly, in the U.S. and abroad. So w what about working with each other? What about working with uh, co-production partners? What about working with a discovery? What about how does that work? How do, how do these folks figure out how to piece this stuff together and, and in this very difficult landscape? I mean, first of all, I say, I always say to people for the ITVS, I'm like, apply three times but you'll get it. <laughs> and oftentimes, you know, and I think it's similarly to what you say, it, lots of times it does pay off. And I think, you know, as you, as you said, you, you do improve in the process, and I know it's totally tedious. Um, but also I think, you know, we, we don't fund anywhere near the levels that you fund. Um, but a lot of ITBS projects have gone to good pitch. Yes. Right, so there's already a natural, I mean, you know, a lot of projects that we funded are, are, are still happening there. One piece, one thing I would say um, about co-producers, um, is that one of the things, and we started this session by talking about kind of, you know, these big lofty goals of democracy and sort of the contribution of journalism and independent voice. You know, one of the things for us is that you as the producer retain editorial, you copyright and you have editorial control over your project. Not all broadcasters, in fact, most other broadcasters, <laughs> that's not the case. And so some of the complexities of co-producing with another outlet apart from some of our constraints around, um, around, um, our funding being for public broadcast, are that editorial control has to remain, as far as we see it, it remains with you, the producer. Sometimes when other channels are paying you to make something, they're not, they're not necessarily paying you to make the film that you've come to them with, they're paying for you to make a film that has more involvement from the, from the broadcaster. And I think it's, it's a very hard call that you have to make as a filmmaker in terms of what you're willing to give up to get your film <laughs> to be, film made, but it's something that I've seen many, many friends and colleagues go through, um, and so I just encourage you to be aware of, of what, you're, you know, what, you, what you're giving up in exchange to get funding to make your film. So how did you guys end up working on the same project? So was that, did, did somebody come to independently to each of you? How did that work? Yeah. Yeah, but the two of you are, have a project. Okay. So, so we, we, we're discussing working on the same. I'm mean, interesting, you might want to talk to this. <laughs> it's uh, Logan Foundation. We, we've had a slight, we've had an interesting year, um, and we've had a hiatus on funding um, due to a legal case. And so, um, but we were in discussion with a filmmaker who has been supported by um, the Logan Foundation, um, who is actually an investigative reporter. Um, and that's a project that you know that we're, we're potentially moving forward with, but that came completely independently. Julian had already got funding from Logan, and I only knew about that because he mentioned it when I spoke do to you, him. And do you do you do you have any limitations on if somebody comes to you with a project, if other people are already in on it, is that a problem for you? Is that what are there any limitations to that? Um, no, it's not a problem. So, do you want to talk about? I get you. you. <laughs> I, 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 it's not a problem. I mean, it's, it's, you know, it's on each individual case. I, I wouldn't preclude working with, with anyone. Uh, you know, there are times when relationships can be difficult or inappropriate, and, you know, you gauge that at the time. But, you know, the, this, this collaboration is through the CIJ, which we fund, and uh, they do a, a lot of work uh, investigative journalism work throughout Europe and around the world, and uh, I, I have no problem with that. In fact, I'm very excited to to see what comes of it. Have any of you, have either of you had 
had uh, any challenges in working with broadcasters? Is that something that's a limitation? Hilariously, yeah, it was actually. Um, because we're a foundation, um, and I had to go through a quite um, prolonged um, experience with um, Ed Pohl at the BBC in the UK, um, because they are quite particular about who they will and won't have co-funding from. So for our filmmakers' sakes, particularly when I was funding more in the UK, I did a sort of, like, it was about an 18-month process mm -hmm. of having our funding approved. Because I, I, there are, in, in terms of my knowledge of some of the broadcasters in the United States, there definitely are limitations on, if you come in with a project that's already been funded, uh, there may be some, some challenges. So, yeah. so you have to... We recently had a problem where a, a major broadcaster backed out uh, at the 11th hour uh, on a major film, uh, and it was a surprise. Because of funders who were involved? Uh, they had their own reasons, uh, none of which I'd go into in public. But, uh, a, you know, it was a major film. It had been mostly shot. Uh, it was done by a, a world-famous documentaryist, and, uh, and they just simply disappeared. And luckily, we were there to take up the slack. But it was a surprise to us, and not pleasant. Does that make you hesitate in the future? I, you, you know, it's, it's sort of a force majeure. Uh, you know, it, these things happen, and, and you just you know, you just have to take it on the chin. But uh, you can't, if you're in this business, be squeamish. You, you got to know that these kinds of things happen, and you got to be tough. Truly, it is not a business for the squeamish. So let's let's open it up for 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 questions from from you all. These are your funders, people. <laughs> Ask them questions. <laughs> Um, I think it's interesting that you're getting into the business of actually providing legal support because in, in we're really here talking about investigative journalism. Mm -hmm. And in investigative journalism, there's two huge potholes. There's access to whatever story you want to get and protection for the filmmaker for, you know, I mean, you know, and I said this in a, in a previous panel, I'm working on a project. I mean, we've been in court now for four solid years. Mm -hmm. And you know, getting you know documents from the federal government, and the, yeah. and interestingly enough, the attorney who took my case took it and said, "I will take your case, um, and I will get my money from the government when we win." Right. So here we are, many years later, and what did the government do? They said, "We will give her what you what she wants, but we're going to give the attorney nothing." So they tried. To, the government tried to separate me from my attorney. And so it, um, which is, you know, it's not an uncommon thing to do when you're trying to punish an attorney who is consistently taking cases that the government doesn't like. So what I think is interesting, and I think it would be great if more of the foundations actually looked at this issue, is that the attorneys who represent these filmmakers, especially in investigative journalists, in journalism, I should say, really need to be, they are partners of that process, and in fact, I changed my film in order to put my attorney in it because now he is a champion and certainly part of the narrative arc of what is an ongoing investigation and how do you get these documents out of the federal government because now not only did it take us this long, which is not unusual, but now the government is punishing him. Mm. And so I think this impulse to dig slightly deeper, I mean, and you know, ITVS does fabulous work and I've been such a huge supporter of you guys for so many years, but that's about the filmmaker. But there is a world in investigative journalism and investigative documentary in particular that is very, very intricate between the kind of the ecosystems that play into whether you can expose something. Mm -hmm. And that's a dangerous place to be. Actually, I mean, it's, it's really interesting. I guess we're sort of approaching it in two different ways. One actually has been the relationship with CIR, which has helped our filmmakers to reach both journalists and lawyers who are helping them with some of this work. Um, and then I think another part of it for us is also around making sure that our film teams are speaking to lawyers early, because 
the reason that we've recently taken a slight hit it was our filmmakers who had a film that was definitely about speaking truth to power and it was journalistically sound, the film was finished, it was about to premiere and one of the characters in the films um, took them to court and basically said, you know, you can't show, th you can't show the film whilst we're suing you. Um, we knew that the case was unfounded um, but we felt that it was our responsibility to the filmmakers to back their cause. So we funded their, um, their legal counsel and their, their case. And we had to also, it, the, the worrying thing there though is if for, for, for me as well, it, is that, that meant that we couldn't give out any other funding to filmmakers. So our production fund was on hold because we were, were like, do you know what, we're standing by our filmmakers. And you know, it was only three weeks ago that we've just, the, the case has been cleared and obviously they, you know, our filmmakers won. And so, you know, we were like, brilliant, you know, pay your costs, da, 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 and now we know what we've got still in our pot that we can actually put into films. But what I really want to do is try and actually get a pot, basically a fighting fund, a fighting fund for filmmakers, because that's what we need. It's seismic in its yeah. importance. Yeah. I hear you. I'd love to hear your story afterwards as well. <laughs> right. Me too. I want to hear the end of it, actually. <laughs> Anyone else? Yeah, in the back. Hi, it's uh, Peter Raymond from Toronto. We've been successful in accessing ITVS funds for several of our films over the years. I understand there's more money for American productions and less money for non-American productions in the last, can you talk about the funding? Sure. Um, when we began our international fund, we, it was, um, actually funded through foundation support. After 9-11, um, we came together with some major foundations and basically talked about the important need for non-US perspectives to be brought to the United States. And we were able to bring some foundations um, to support what ended up becoming over 100 films from I think over 80 countries and being distributed on ultimately 35 platforms, including broadcast and some early digital distribution for those films. Um, that was a five-year fund. Um, with our Corporation for Public Broadcast Funding, CPB, which is U.S. taxpayer, we are, you know, we have a focus on U.S. filmmakers because of the nature of CPB funding. And so we're always trying to bring more resources to non-U.S. films and subjects and filmmakers, but we're working within the parameters of, our, of the funding that we receive that we can, that we can uh, disperse. So that's why, Peter. So why don't you, Richard, why don't you talk, you fund both internationally and, and domestically. Do you have a, a balance or is it project by project? How does it work? No limitation on country or on or location. No, you know you're looking for a compelling story, and you're looking for a filmmaker who can tell that story from end to end. They can get it from the idea and conception to the finished product, and those are that's the all you have to see. And Bert Doc, I know you you've got a pretty wide range. How many countries are you in now? Do, doing good pitch and oh gosh. Um, well, good pitch now, uh, we have hub events in Europe. We've just done the Nordic countries um, and we're doing Copenhagen in March of next year. Um, we've got an event in New York in uh, November and then hopefully an event in Miami in June. Um, and then it's also going to Latin America. We have partners who run it in China. We've actually got one in Nairobi in Kenya on Saturday. And um, I was just Skyping with the team. Um, yeah, it's, it's global, and what, just so, you know, it's not about us going into countries, it's about us partnering with organisations in country who have approached us and said we'd like to run this in our country, and then we try and raise funds for them and enable them to put an event on and grow an industry and then leave them to it. It's not about us trying to do it ourselves, but it's, yeah, it's, it's, it's gone global. Yep. Hi, Robert Schroeder with International Investor. You each must have boards of directors or some constituencies that eventually want to know how big an audience you were able to gather for these projects, I imagine. What, what time period do you give yourselves? Uh, half a year, a year before you feel like there's enough evidence that you've collected enough 
people who have watched these programs with whatever um, ancillary markets you've been able to discover. And, and uh, final question, if, you, if I could slip another one in. Will you look at a series instead of an individual project? Go for it. Richard? Uh, you always uh, are, are you, you have to pay the price in the boardroom. Uh, I, I think, it, again, it's project by project, but you, know, you need to show that the money you've invested uh, has been meaningful and that you've invested wisely. So if you, know, you do your spade work first and, and you know, chances are uh, it's going to be returned to you in, in some kind of measurable impact. Uh, often it's in uh, audience, uh, in bums on seats, or uh, it may be that it's, it's actually changed. It's changed the law or changed the, the, the discussion, you know. So you're not expl exclusively looking at say, was this released with a major broadcaster, or how many, how long it ran in theaters, or the awards that it won, those are, can be measures, but that, those are not the only measures. Those are some measures, uh, but there are greater measures. I mean, there are, are pieces of, of film, pieces of art, that have changed the world, uh, and you know it when it happens. How about Bird Talk? I think that's, it's, that's really important. I think there's also the thing like, you know, documentary at its finest can just change how you feel about things and that's immeasurable but sort of like you, you understand it when you see it and like some of the films that I've been proudest of haven't necessarily been the most award winning or sort of widely seen but they're films that have been sort of like have just changed my perceptions and my understanding of either a sort of issue or, or of, of people in a really sort of beautiful way of interconnectivity um, so don't get me wrong, of course, awards, everybody loves them. Um, and, you know, yes, you want your films to get shown on Netflix and blah, blah, blah. But there are, I think there are other measures. And I think, you know, I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm always trying to do that fine line of, um, of doing a bit of each of it. Like, A, impact, B, awards, and C, just beautiful stories. Yeah, how about IV ITVS? So it's funny, we actually generate reports uh, for you. It's kind of, we flip it, because when we fund it and distribute it through public broadcasting, we give you a full carriage report, so you find out your overnights, and then you find out you know, how many households watched it, and you get a breakdown of that. So that's the piece that we deliver to you as, as a filmmaker. Um, but many, many filmmakers that we've worked with, and you know, I mean, The Invisible War comes to mind, which was an independent lens film about rape in the military and sexual assault in the military, had huge impact from the legislative to the cultural to the, I mean, it had a huge, you know, and the, those filmmakers did a major, and they had partners, I'm sure, on the stage and beyond, so it wasn't only an ITVS project, but they put together a very large impact report of which the broadcast was one piece, but then they had many other measures. Um, it's a great example if you guys are looking for kind of examples of impact reports. Um, so I would say we are in the business of receiving them, of contributing to them, of sometimes doing our own. We had a five-year campaign called Women and Girls Lead, which included nearly 60 films about women and girls. And we've done many reports looking at the impact of you know, that cumulative number of films over the years. So I think we've, we've looked at this from all sides and are happy to you know, show some best practices and contribute. But I think it's a huge part of, of what you want to do because you want to, you want to tell the story of, of your film and then you want to tell the story of what happened because of your film. And I think it's, there's some really great tools out there to also track what you're doing. We have a project right now actually with a federal agency down the street called USAID um, where we're taking films that we funded through Women and Girls Lead and we're showing them in countries around the world. And USAID is, you know, it's like a development partner who's like, we want to measure attitude change and behavior change and so coming up and really trying to look at how you might do that has been a great exercise for us. Um, and we're you know, looking at what tools are useful and what partners we've needed to bring on board to do that kind of measurement in other countries based on films and community screenings. So 
I think it's it's a very dynamic and important part of the work that we're all doing, um, and I think you just have to be really open and look for good examples and and be part of that conversation because I think it's a huge data and data measurement is going to be you know it's just such a huge part of what we're all really doing. Um, as is journalism, I just want to go back, Andrea, to kind of the beginning of this. To me, these last three years have been unbelievable. With a, I can't even keep up with the changing definitions of journalism. When I started at ITVS, we were not journalism. We were like point of view, social issue, filmmaking. And it has become so much less clear, and even in the last couple years, the definitions are changing faster than we can track. What is investigative journalism versus, you know, point of view versus, um, you know, it's just, it's, it's really fascinating. It's an amazing time to be a storyteller. Um, and like my colleagues on the stage have said, just telling the story that you want to tell and worrying less about the definition of what it is or isn't, but being as truthful to the story that you can be is what I'm seeing as the most successful projects that are coming to us. Um, we are doing partnerships, I will say, with Frontline. You had asked about partnerships. Sometimes Independent Lens, which is our series that we co-curate with, with PBS. Sometimes there's a project that is sort of somewhere in between a Frontline and what we'd consider an Independent Lens. And more and more, we just look for a partnership between the two series and can bring resources that both series can bring to bear. Um, on a story that might seem a little more like it's got an investigative journalism slant or you need more reporters or you need more, you know, you need some of that. So I think we're, we're all being pretty fluid um, and I encourage you guys to be fluid too because it's an exciting time to be a storyteller. So but I also I? think that one of the things that we're missing here on the stage is if, the, if we had a commercial broadcaster yeah. here, we'd be, you'd be hearing a completely different answer. Uh, in terms of eyeballs, in terms of how long it ran, in terms of, of return on investment, uh, no question. And in fact, I would be very interested to also have somebody from the world of audio, from radio here, uh, because that's, a, again, there is a whole, as we know, I mean, there's a tremendous movement toward uh, interest in pro the process of journalism, of, of the process of the storytelling, and, and in series and in podcasts. Um, that is all being funded somewhat differently, as, as we know. So, uh, so again, y your answer is going to be different depending on the funder you're talking to. Sorry, could I just jump in and say, I'm just going to, sorry, this is really naughty of me, but um, I'm just going to give one little plug just in, 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 in response to what you were saying, is in terms of some of the impact stuff, if anybody is interested in impact, I, you know, in how you look at creating impact with films and also how you measure it, um, we've got an open resource guide called the Impact Field Guide, which is actually a really useful analysis of how to create change with films. And we also run the Doc Impact Award, so we did the sort of um, impact review of Invisible War and like various other films, and looking at different campaign strategies and how different campaign strategies can either, you know, be top down, bottom up. You know, what what is your film trying to do, and sort of like how you can create that change, and then how you can measure it and report back, because that actually has become increasingly important for funders as well. So it's just worth. Where do people at that. find it? Impactfieldguide.org, I think. <laughs> And, and how, do they, how do they approach you? And you should probably each answer this. Is there a website? Is there a phone call? Is there a submission? What's your submission process? Uh, we have an open submission um, for the Journalism Fund. And then we have um, closed rounds for, we've got an engagement fund, an outreach fund called Connect Fund. And that's a closed round. Um, but everything is on our website. It's pretty um, It's pretty. I think, I think it's pretty clear. Um, and my email address is also on the website, although I would encourage you to probably email Luke rather than me, because he's a lot better at getting back to people. Richard, I tend to lose Richard it. how about you? Uh, we have a website. You can do an LOI. If you, uh, you can contact us by phone. We're contacted at conferences like this, uh, in dark alleys, uh, <laughs> you know, just about any place. The fact that you're open to that means that you will be mobbed, I think, at this some point. Don't get any ideas. <laughs> <laughs> um, and you, and your website yeah, as well. Of course. I mean, you know, hopefully, and we've actually just, we've done a very large website redesign in the last year with filmmakers in mind. We just noticed over the years it was starting to get so much information, and we really went back, and we're like, we really want this to be, you know, the number one person who's using our website is a filmmaker looking for funding. So hopefully it's been redesigned in a way that makes it clear on where to go and, and how to find funds and how to apply to our various cycles. But all the information is there. And of course, our staff, um, you know, we do have a wonderful field relations team who really tries to make themselves available at 
many conferences and festivals and all of that. And ITVS, you know, again, we're public servants, um, and we're here to help you get your work made. And, and so the feedback is always good too. Good. You have good feedback. I mean, I think then good. and are very approachable. So. I hope so. Our staff is made up of a lot of filmmakers themselves and people who are really, really, you know, committed to projects um, like the ones that you guys ostensibly are making. And so, you know, use our website, contact our team, and um, and apply. Great. Looks like there's a question back there. I was I was curious uh, whether uh, your respective criteria in choosing. Uh, looks at all at the role of a traditional print investigative uh, reporter or report, um, how much of a difference does it make uh, whether the filmmaker involved either has hired a print reporter on a story as a consultant, has a background in traditional uh, print reporting, um, uh, uh, or is working off of um, you know, an established, already published account. Um, and a related question, whether you ever have a print reporter who has a story who looks to you for um, recommendations for a filmmaker to, to produce it. Why don't you start with that, Richard? As far as the, uh, if it, is it an enhancement to, when you have a project that's got a reporter with it? The answer is it? yes. And I think there are, there are a number of reasons why that's true. Uh, not the least of which uh, it, it helps get the story right and make sure that the fact checking is done properly. Uh, and fact checking really needs to start right at the beginning. Uh, and if you, you start with a pure story that's uh, not got too many holes in it, uh, it's going gonna, it's gonna to flow better. And we have had inquiries from uh, print journalists uh, about possible projects projects and where they might go. Uh, we could talk about it later. Um, do either one of you want to take that uh, as well or not? Um, we've, we've worked with, I guess we've worked across both. So there are a few that are collaborating, have approached us with a director and a print journalist. Um, there are a few that are print journalists doing their first directing gigs. Um, and I'm totally cool with that. I like working with new directors. Um, the bit that I haven't done is recommended directors to journalists. And I think it's because of the way that we fund people. You know, we are about funding directors' passion projects. We're not, because we don't give, like I'm, I'm not giving somebody 800k to make a whole film. I'm giving you sort of like 50 to 100. Um, so it's, I, I don't feel like I can say, go and hire a director for hire. That just, it doesn't, that's not how I work. Um, so it sort of has to come to us with both attached. And I, and I would say that's probably true in a lot of cases, that, it, that it, it's coming with the strongest possible team uh, is, is, is what's going to get the door open. So it really, I think, is, is a matter of finding the right partner before you approach somebody is, is generally going to be the best way to do that, is to find the director who's worked on material like yours and um, create a partnership. And that's the strong unit. Uh, and I would say that that's really coming in with a strong team is one thing that, that a lot of funders are going to look for. Can you, can you actually deliver this story? They're, they're, they really want to know if they put their money in it, you know, can, can you really do it? So your, your team is really going to be an important part. And frankly, nobody's brought this up, but your budget is also an important part because the budget really tells you an awful lot about how well somebody's thought th something through. You can, you know, if you've been pitched thousands of stuff, which is, stories, which we all have, you, you, you can tell right away from the budget whether or not they know what they need to do. So it's really creating that whole package and as, as strongly as possible. And you talked a little bit about footage. You know, have you got access to your characters and what are they like on film? Um, so it's, it's, really, it's really creating that. So I don't know whether you'd agree with that or not, but. I agree 100%. I think that you've you know, made really essential points. I mean, for us, you know, the truth often comes out in the budget in so many ways. It's where you really understand what somebody you know, means when they're describing what they're going to do. It's like they're going to tell this incredible story and they're planning to be shooting for two weeks, OK? Or conversely, it's like, wow, they have a three-year edit. Hmm. Like, so you really start to understand the kind of the real thinking um, that's gone into it. So that's huge. The truth is in the budget. Um, and it's funny because I did not come to this as a budget person, but I have since become such a budget person. I used to be like, oh, right, I would look for the total and be like, okay, 
and then you slowly realize it's all it's all in there. Um, the team huge, and I will say on our on our discussion teams where we're evaluating uh, proposals, it is really a deep conversation. You should know how much people care about you and your team. It'll be like at the level of, well, this person you know has done this kind of film, and so. You know, people, I mean, they really get into it and they really want to understand the assets of their team. I think it's great if you can also be honest about some of your own vulnerabilities on your team and how you're planning to address it because no team is flawless. Every team has its, its issues and the more self-aware you are of what you need and how you've covered it, great. Um, so that's huge. I think that's huge. And then access. You know, I can't tell you how many times a filmmaker has an amazing idea but they can't get the story. And that's where the investigative journalism piece and the documentary piece you know, come together again, right? As a journalist, your sources, as a documentary filmmaker, your sources, right? And who do you have trust with? Who's gonna talk to you? Who's gonna let you film with them? Who's gonna let you into those parts of their life? Why would they? Do they trust you? What relationship do you have? Who are you to them? And so that piece of it is huge. That is very much discussed in our group is what is your relationship to your subjects and your characters? And can you get the story that you're, that you're pitching? Um, and that will be really looked at carefully. So no, budget, team, and access. Huge. Knowing that your story is probably going to wander off the path. I mean, that, it, no one's being rigid about that. Uh, but it's it is knowing you can do this, um, whether it's a great editor or it's a director that you've worked with or or whatever. So the the team is really important. experience has been with film festivals. I initiated a festival, Margaret Mead, 40 years ago, and I started the Environmental Film Festival here. And I wondered, uh, 25 years ago, and I wondered about what you all felt about the experience of showing films in film festivals, uh, and even the impact of, of this wonderful film festival that we're part of here today. I'm, I'll start, I'm going to start with that, because it, it, it actually, and i am be curious to see whether or not you all agree, but to some extent, that is now the primary distribution model for a lot of documentary films. Um, and it's, it's the best way to get your film out there. So uh, it's also the best way if you're trying to attract a distributor, certainly. Um, and uh, you know they've been, become critically important in the sort of distribution infrastructure, if you will. Because again, there's so much out there that getting picked up for distribution in theaters is increasingly difficult. So. I, my I, my sense is that a lot of films are getting their traction um, through film festivals. So, do you all agree? I totally agree. I also think it's um, a, a brilliant place for filmmakers to actually sort of bring their films back to different communities as well. Um, you know, of course, everybody wants to launch at Sundance, Tribeca, or whatever. Um, but actually, the, the the smaller festivals around the country are really important ways, as you say, of connecting films to audiences. And I, if even if I like, think sometimes when the filmmakers can't attend, actually having you know the the characters of the film attending as well can be a really sort of empowering experience. So I think they have a huge place in the whole ecosystem. And, and in fact, as you know, you you since you were with the Environmental Film Festival. In some cases, the most successful. We're talking about a match here between between projects, funders, and also between projects and and film festivals. That they're increasingly the best film festivals. Even the smaller ones have really either dug into their communities, they represent their communities, they engage their communities in a new way. So again, it's also a matter of being very strategic about how you think about a release, a festival release strategy, uh, and what really works with your project. And increasingly, since we are not just in the long form world, there are increasing numbers that are doing short form, and there are some that are considering series. So, uh, so it's 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 a it's a it's an area that's I think open. Um, I echo all of that. Film festivals are huge, um, and I'm a huge fan of the film festivals that you've been involved with. Um, and it's really not a but, it's an and. I'm also always looking for ways to reach audiences who might not see themselves as the kind of people who go to a film festival, but who might go to a free screening, right? Um, like with our, what we used to call community cinema, which is now called Indie Lens Pop-Up, we're in about 100 communities across the country for free screenings. It can be at schools, libraries, there's a conversation around a film. Um, and to me, that's been one of the most moving parts of it. So it's not necessarily an audience that, you know, is going to a film festival, but they're going out for, a conversation around a topic, um, and I think it's an essential part of our democracy. And I think it's so important that people, you know, use the kinds of films that you all are making to catalyze community 
conversations. Um, it's huge, and it, I think it's been meaningful for filmmakers who have gone to those in ways that they didn't even expect to see their films being used on the ground like that. So, you know, because I think that film festivals, just to finish, are really incredible because of the invested, engaged audiences, but I think they can also feel exclusive to people who don't go to film festivals <laughs> um, or don't get tickets or don't understand how to find it. So it's finding that balance of making sure that films are available um, to everyone um, and being used by everyone. Yeah, please. Yeah. Yes. Should be tossing to you. Yes. Nina. To my mind, one of the most interesting parts of the experience was being able to see and experience a film on a big screen. And whether it's in a festival or in a free screening or something, there is something about the immersive experience that really is transformative, both not just for the filmmaker, but for the audience, and you know, for the, to, to be able to meet the individuals, to have a conversation. As we have started to look more on here for our information, that the idea that somehow that we gather around and have a conversation and see something that is where we turn the lights down and we shut it off and we have that experience that is the filmic moment is so is so incredibly valuable and if anything Flo I think that film festivals are more important than they've ever been before because of that I mean, everything has become more and more reductionist, mm -hmm. so something that blows it open is, is, is beyond parallel. Well, it's the, it's the primary way most films are finding their audiences right. at this exactly. point. And I want to add one other thing. I, I, there's a question back here, but I think the other thing that, that we all need to be thinking about is, is the boxes that we get put in. Um, we've been talking about documentary. Documentary isn't one thing. It's a nonfiction storytelling form. And it can be a comedy, it can be a dramedy, it can be a drama, it can be an adventure, it can be advocacy, it can be journalism, it can be any number of things. And, you know, we have a lot of work in this room to do to convince people that it isn't all one thing. And it's not all boring. It can be incredibly moving and uh, infuriating and enraging and exciting and uh, emotional and all those things. And so, I, I really urge everyone to think about opening up their own definitions and the, the way they talk about what we all do because it's, it's huge. It's not one box. And despite what the Academy thinks, there is not just one documentary. So uh, anyway, that's too much of a story. I just wanted to unpack uh, a term that you, that you said earlier. You said festival release strategy. Um, from a realistic perspective, that there really is not that assumes that your film is going to get into a festival in the first place. As someone who has sat on the screening committee at AFI Docs, I can tell you that that is a very subjective process and it is not guaranteed that you're going to get into a festival, which just speaks to your point about everybody wants to get into Sundance because if you get into Sundance, then you have a festival release strategy because you will get into just about any other festival you want. You will get invited to festivals. You won't have to go through the at-large submission process. So, you know, I think to say that, you know, to, to think about a festival release strategy, it, it's, that's a little bit pie in the sky. No offense. How, not offended. Um, <laughs> it, however, it's the same thing as looking for a funder. If you have a film that is best suited for a festival in New York or that's the Environmental Film Festival, don't submit it to AFI Docs. Submit it there. So it's a matter of not broadcasting it, but being considered about it. And again, the same thing with your, with your funders, is are you the right match? Are, is it a social issue documentary? Is it a social action documentary? If it's not, maybe you shouldn't be talking to Brit Doc, you probably shouldn't be talking. I, it's so, yeah, all right, okay. But it's, it's, talk to her anyway. But, it, but I'm talking about being considered, and that's what I mean. I, yes, of, it, of course, if you get into Sundance, the doors fly open. But also sending your film out just to the five big festivals isn't right necessarily the right thing to do for your film, and it doesn't necessarily mean you're not going to get into a film festival. It means, where, actually, where is that film festival in Georgia it, that is showing a lot of shorts, and they're really interested in this kind of material? So. Mm -hmm.
Okay. Thank you so much. This has been very interesting, and we appreciate you taking the time.